Murray. Thank you, Jamie. If, if this morning um, could have been categorised as the theoretical, uh, then this afternoon might be might be might be a little bit more of the practical because I'm joined uh, at the front by people who, to one in one way or another, make their living from the land. Uh, and I'll let them explain a little bit more uh, about that in a minute. But before I forget, if uh, today you're a professional who could use the hours that we're spending here for continuing professional development, um, could you let me know, please? I, I know there's a few lawyers, and, and lawyers always like to get something for nothing. Uh, so we, we can use a little bit uh, of the time there. But if there's anyone in that category... Um, could you please let me know, please? So, I, I'm going to ask the, those who are at the front here to uh, start off by saying who they are, uh, where you come from, what you do, um, and we'll leave it at that for now. So, who you are, where you come from, and what you do. Uh, my name's Peter Ross McCray. I a, own a small family farm over in Drumadrobit. Um, I try and farm it sustainably, as it's got to want us to, to over stretch our resources or put too many animals and just that's how the, that's my attitude to it anyway and I've been doing that for 20 years in a previous life I was a school teacher in the inner cities of London many many years ago so it's I came back to my roots basically because I grew up on a tenanted farm that my father had away down near Fort William so I have some breadth of experience of both kinds of things I own it now but I grew up on a tenant farm so that's kind of where I come from Thank you, Peter. I'm Andrew Murchison. I was born in Inverness and headed to Aberdeen for a while after that, Edinburgh, back to Perth, and then came back up to Inverness. I practiced as a lawyer. I came back to Inverness in 1998, and since then I've been engaged in, in business, part of the time with Murray, who's one of my colleagues and fellow directors in the business. And a high proportion of my work is related to land issues. They're not all disputes. <laughs> not land issues. Thank you. I'm Jamie Williamson, Laird of Alvey and Dalrady Estates, which is between Aviemore and Kinusi. Uh, we farm cows, sheep, trees, and tourists. <laughs> um, we don't fleece the tourists like the sheep. Uh, my background is I'm actually a forester. I got a PhD in forestry. I'm the most overqualified firewood merchant in Benoch. Um And we try, and it's a family estate. Uh, we try to survive off the estate. We try to breed our own labour, thinking it would be more cost effective, but they've all emigrated and we're trying now to persuade them to come back. <coughs> Jamie, I, I don't know if you, if you yourself are going to star uh, in the programme tonight, but BBC are running a, a programme just now called The Mountain, um, and uh, a lot of Jamie's um, colleagues, shall I say, employees, tenants maybe? Tenants, maybe, tenants, maybe, maybe yes. say, yeah, well, they're stars of the show as well, so that's a wee plug for the BBC uh, Scotland's uh, programme, the, the Mountain. So. Good. Uh, can maybe each of the three of you, would you be able to say something? As, as the audience, what we're going to do in, the, in this wee next section is we're going to think again about questions. So if you want to ask if there's been things that have been going around your mind this morning, well, I didn't ask that, or you'll try and bring it in a practical context if you've got some questions for these guys uh, as well. But as, just as you, as you think on that, um, maybe the three of you uh, would say something, please, about how what you've heard this morning maybe some of the principles about what you've heard the, this morning, um, how they impact upon how you conduct your business, whether that's around the land reform issue or whether it's the theological background that uh, uh, Jamie spoke about this morning. So can you maybe say a, a little bit? Um, Peter, do you, do you want to go first again? I missed this morning. Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> that's 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 a slight like disadvantage. No, a major advantage. But I imagine that, that, I tell it like the, the theological bit was covered this morning in the... You know, how we treat land and how we, how we work it and how we work with animals. And that's the way I look at it. But I suppose that has been covered, is it? It's, uh, What's your view about, about how you work with animals? And well, I think all animals should be have a proper looking after. And, you know, I, I do hear of farmers have what they call dying percentages because they keep so many that, you know, and things like that. I don't think like that at all. I don't want anything to die if I can help it. So I try and work 
keep plenty of scope and resources been for keeping all my animals and not overdo my land and not overuse it and rest it and work to these principles. I think that's, I think that's something that should be done. And, and a curious side effect of having changed and done that over the last so many years, I actually probably earn more money that way because actually less is more in some respects. Uh, the animals I keep are, treat me better and are more prosperous, they give me more quality, so in a strange way, it, it's a better way and it's, it's rewarding me even more so by, by working like that. So, so in previous lives, you know, the subsidy and cap reforms people chased, what you call the brown envelope and kept numbers of things high and lost large numbers of beasts. Well, I don't work with that anymore anyway. So that's, and the lot of, I don't really get much subsidy anyway, so I try and make my money out of what I have. So I think by using my resources the best I can and not stretching them, not or I'm being you know, cruel to animals in any way, I, can, I think I've come off better that way. So that's my kind of philosophy. <laughs> A, a real life example, if you like, of a less is more, but yes. putting into practice what <coughs> what you believe. Yes, that's a, a fair, yes, that's a fair s- way summary of, of that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Do you want to say? Anything? Well, it's tricky to actually know on what basis you can say uh, this has influenced the way I would be a lawyer. We do work for both landlords and for tenants, and your job is to do the job within the bounds of the professional obligations on you for your client. That's, the, that's what the job is. But what I find very helpful from this morning is just this emphasis on, as Christians, thinking about <coughs> how we would like Scotland to be. And I think that's, that's just been a very helpful, helpful way of thinking about it, thinking about the country. And it's not something that I've really thought about. I tended to think about uh, Christianity in the scope of your own individual life, how you deal with others, but looking at the big picture of what we actually want for Scotland in the li- years that lie ahead, I find that helpful, I find it, find it refreshing, I find it thought-provoking, and I think there are issues there that we need to think through and try to try to work towards. I, I would actually agree with Murdo that at some <coughs> levels the, the, the Land Reform Bill is, is relatively modest, it seems that it doesn't seem uh, nuclear, if I could describe it that way. And so much of, of what was anticipated was not... It was thought, well, here are the SNP, they're coming up with this, they're going to change this as well. What's it going to do? And I, I had my apprehension that it was going to be nuclear, but I don't think it is. And I think it ha- you can see that it has objectives within it, which, uh, well, certainly speaking personally, I think it has objectives within it which I can subscribe to. I think it's positive. And I think it's helpful, even if you don't agree with everything that's there, it's helpful for you, if you're a Christian, to be thinking along these lines of what do you want to see in Scotland in terms of benefiting those who uh, are uh, in need, protecting the weak, and making sure that we have fairness. These are issues that we should be thinking about, so I find it very helpful. Thank you. Um, Jamie, I'm coming to you. J- Jamie and I... Um, know each other partly through an organisation called Scottish Land and Estates and uh, Scottish Land and Estates have been in various guises in the past and are often thought to be the the trade body, if you like, for, of landowners um, in Scotland. My interest in that is professional uh, as a lawyer. One of the things that has struck me, Jimmy, uh, about you is that you are exceptionally good, exceptionally good at putting forward a positive face for a, a what a, what a helpful and good landowner uh, in Scotland should look like in the 21st century. And you're not slow. Uh, I, I'd want to commend you uh, uh, about that. You're not slow in saying that um, to, to lots of people. But um, tell us a little bit, um, Jamie, if you would, please, about how what you heard this morning. Does that resonate with um, how you behave as a landowner? Or, or does it not? Are there a bit of disconnect there? Or t- Tell us what you think. Uh, certain amount of disconnect. I mean, the thing that really came out from the politicians this morning was it was all very complicated. <laughs> and they couldn't give us an answer, whether it was the tenancies or what have you. Uh, I felt a little bit it's, uh, you know, whereas I'm desperate to trying to improve our economy. And by improving our economy, not only if they want to go independent, it would be easier to go independent, but it would also filter down 
into helping the community by improving the economy, we're providing more jobs, and because we don't take much out, we put everything back in, we hopefully improve everything. Um, my concern is in improving the economy, I do things selling expensive bulls, including to Peter. Hopefully my bull isn't like a politician, all promise and no action. <laughs> but, uh, um, but I do feel that, um, yes, a certain amount resonates. We're quite keen. I mean, uh, Dave Thompson said about uh, transparency of ownership. Great. What he failed to say was that actually we j we've had the register of Sacines since 1609. We do have a registration and it's the, I think it's the oldest one in the world. But, yes, it needs reform. We've now got new land registration, digital. It means I can know exactly what my neighbour's got. Great. Um, we want to know who owns what. But the difficulty you've got is exactly the same as a company. If you're buying or selling from Google or Starbucks, you actually know who's there and what you're dealing with. Uh, when we come down to this thing of the 432 people owning half of Scotland, well, actually, you know, it's only half of the, it's of the private section in Scotland, and of those 432 people, a lot of them are people like Rio Zin Tinto Zinc, which has got, you know, thousands of shareholders. Uh, some are a uh, recent neighbour, uh, Hirama from who makes the big cranes in uh, uh, offshore has just bought Balaval Estate but by the time we try and deal with it and I try to rent land off it I found actually no it's in an offshore company but we're not going to solve that in land reform this is a problem when you're dealing with business when I deal with a business I don't actually know very often whether I'm dealing with someone down the road or in Inverness, or actually if it's a subsidiary of something bigger and something bigger. And I think we actually need more transparency with our whole business section. Mm -hmm. Land and land reform is just one bit of it. However, the new Register of Scotland will allow us to be able to go on a map and say, right, who owns it? We can get an ownership, and if we can get someone who we can actually speak to, to my mind, that's great. So. That's been tremendous. Um, where we're going to run into problems is things like tenancies. You've got to remember that a tenancy... I've tried when I took over the land to lamb every lamb, knock in every fence post, cut down every tree. It didn't work. Um, I now have to realise that actually I'm not a people person. So I have G2 outdoor dealing with all the punters doing the zip wire. I've got a, a pro professional, you know, nice-faced lady, lady who runs a caravan park who deals with the people. I deal with the drains. She deals with the, you know, the people. I, so I have, in fact, I deal with the cow sheep and trees, and my assistant, he deals with anything that answers back. So, <laughs> you know, we realise that we've got to split it. Now, exactly the same with tenancies. Um, I can have a sporting tenant, because I don't like shooting that much. Uh, I can have a farming tenant. Okay, I do do the farming. I can have a, a um, forestry tenant. I've got someone doing the horse riding. I've got someone doing the zip wires. The tenancies can all stack up on the same piece of land, and that works. Where it doesn't work is where one tenancy, or if you deal with a tenancy, and having dealt with the uh, freedom of contract, then the government steps in and says, oh, no, no, it doesn't matter what you put in the tenancy, that person has rights over everyone else. And that is what has happened with the agricultural tenancies. And now, and unfortunately I blame the solicitors, who immediately say, oh, don't do an agricultural tenancy, because you might lose that land. And if you lose that land, you've got all sorts of implications. So my feeling is, yes, we have a problem, we need to lance a boil, as Dave Thompson says, but by putting a right to buy or more and more restrictions, we're actually going to be counterproductive and we're going to have even fewer tenancies. I think we're losing what, 120 tenancies in Scotland per year. 
uh, of agricultural tenancies because it's no longer worth the landowner doing a tenancy. If I want to sell the land, I'll sell it. If I want a tenancy so that we can do other things on the land, then we do a tenancy. But if that tenancy means that that tenant can then overrule everything I've um, done with them and overrule other tenants, then I'm not going to do that tenancy. Now we're hitting a similar thing with uh, land to, uh, houses to rent. We came into housing. Uh, if I'm short of cash, I'll sell a piece of land for housing if I can get planning. Uh, but as I'm trying to make a living off the land, every time I sell a piece of land, it makes it more difficult for me to make a living. Therefore, actually I'm better to build a house and rent it. You know, I can't be proud. I, you know, I start with cows, sheep and trees. That's what I prefer. But if I have to farm tourists or pensioners or houses, um, fine. That allows the mix and allows it to build up. But again, the, what they're now saying is that if I get a tenant in there, I may not be able to ever get the person out. And that could cause me a problem. So what's happening is the more restrictions we're putting on some of the tenancies, the more bigger the disincentive it is to have a tenancy. And we're actually creating a problem, which concerns me, because actually what we would like as a landowner is more tenants. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Jimmy. One of the things that you mentioned there, Jimmy, um, is just about this access to information about who owns the, the land. There's certainly a provision about that in the bill, um, which would go slightly further, I think, than what is already the, the case. Um, the government passed legislation a couple of years ago now to do with the Land Register of Scotland. And the Land Register is a computerised um, scheme which covers the whole of Scotland and they are stated, the, the registers of Scotland who look after that, their stated aim is that by 2024, I think it is, the Land Register would cover all of Scotland. So any of us would be able Currently it's £3 or something that I pay and I can put in an address, I can put in somebody's name uh, or their address or their postcode and I can find out from that land register if that land is already registered. So to, to a certain extent, this proposal that's coming in this bill isn't really giving us anything new apart from the, the framework, the skeleton, for which to start asking who's behind that ownership right, of ground. Which brings me to, uh, just kind of share that as a point of information, but it brings me to a question that, that, that I want to ask, um, particularly Jamie, but I want to ask all, all three of you about this, which is that the, the ideological shift, if you like, that there is in the bill about the community's right to buy. Well, it's not, it's not so much a shift, because it's already there in, in some context. There is already examples where communities have come together when the, the land has come on the market and they've exercised the right to buy. The land reform bill as it is just now has got a proposal in it that if the landlord is deemed to be using the land in a non-sustainable way, Mark will correct me if I'm getting this wrong, uh, in a, a non-sustainable way, then provided certain tests are met, then it's not just uh, David Campbell waking up tomorrow and saying, you know, that the landowner around about me uh, in Novara states, you know, they're not behaving sustainably, I don't like what they're doing. David's got to go and get all of you guys as his neighbours together, form a community association, go through lots of registration hoops and then make the application uh, to do it. So there's lots and lots of process to, to go through. But the question I want to, to ask you, particularly Jamie, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in your answer to this, is around what, what lies behind all this. Is community ownership, do you think, is it better as a model? Is it a better way to own land, particularly rural land in Scotland? Is that better than a series of 432 institutions or individuals, some of whom are faceless, some of whom choose not to interact with the people that live in, in, in that area, and, but some of whom, I've already commended you, Jimmy, but some of whom are really, really good in terms of landowners. So I'm not leading you to the answer. Um, I'm interested to hear what, what you have to say about this ideological shift about community versus private individual. Is that a better model of ownership, do you think? Uh, Jimmy, you go first. Yeah. It's, it's a different model. 
Um, I was always brought up that the most efficient way of running a business is have a dictatorship of one. Um, and uh, it's subject to the way. But, uh, so she's the dictator. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, my feeling is, is that uh, what happens is you buy the land and invest in it because either you're a farmer, a forester, or you have an interest in it. And when you lose your interest, you sell it out. Um, you therefore, hopefully, certainly with a family ownership, um, the beauty is that you hope that your children who take it on have actually learnt the business and come up through the business. Now, the difficulty with a community ownership, the thing that holds them together is that they're living in that area. Now, if we'd taken it 100 years ago, the majority of people living in the local community would have been brought up and been associated with the rural business in that area. That's no longer the case, and particularly in our case where it's a national park. The majority of people living in the villages and in the community actually have no <coughs> connection and have never had a connection with the farming, forestry, uh, land management in our area. Now, what worries me is that many of them, particularly in our area, because we're in the National Park, come because it's a nice, serene, wilderness place to come. Uh, or they've got it because they like the seclusion and exclusivity. Whereas what I'm trying to do is, I've got to survive by making a living off it. So I need to have my sheep, my cows, my sawmills, my wind farm, my hydro scheme, or what have you. And to many of them, that's an uh, you know, they're dead against this. So obviously I can get into conflict. Now, am I, by exploiting the land and trying to make it, improve it in employing people, am I good and sustainable? Or, whereas my neighbor would say, no, I'm exploiting the area. He's conserving it. He's got a wilderness. So which one is best? And I'm sure there's a large proportion in our local community who feel that actually my neighbor who's doing nothing but shooting a few pheasants and stuff, is actually um, preserving it. Because what I've done is I've put in roads, I've put in timber, I've got sawmills, etc. Um, they would feel that actually he's conserving it. Whereas what I'm saying is, no, I'm making our area and the nation more self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. So who is correct? Thank you. Peter, do you want to... I kind of agree with Jamie. Um, I've seen so many examples growing up of places that just been left derelict and to nothing, and nobody does anything with them. I mean, if you try to do something with it, you have to go through a ring of who owns it and who could you speak to, and, and you get nowhere. So I kind of agree with him. I like to see something going on in the land or even in the highlands the way it is, even if it, you know, it upsets somebody else because otherwise, poor people will have an exodus. We've lost enough young people to cities and to jobs elsewhere. I just think. There has to be something going on. Um, you know, wilderness for people to come and look at. It's sometimes not for people to live in and to work in and to bring up families and go to schools. So um, I feel that, in a way, he's, he's right. Might not have, his neighbours might not like it, but you know, if there's no activity and nobody's got a job and nobody's got a house and there's not a small school and there's nothing, I don't think you've got a community at all. Um, so it's, it's a difficult thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Andrew, do you have a view? Yes, I, I would agree as well. I think that the point's well made. That it, it's really flagging up what I think is going to be uh, a rich source of litigation in the future, if I may say so, uh, which is the question of what is uh, what is sustainable, what's sustainable development. It's 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 looks as a nice phrase that you could just nail that down, but even in the in the, the brief exploration of that that was given by you, you can see the tensions. Are you talking about sustainable over two years, five years, twenty years? Is it more important to to conserve for future tourism use, or is it more important to have economic use in the short term? It's all there as a complete uh, bun fight, really, in almost any situation that you want. And I, I just think that you will have these types of arguments coming into play. On the question of the community body versus private landowner, well, we've heard already that, that there are good examples and there are bad examples of both. Uh, I think the difficulty that you have is that with a committee you'll have different views and 
some people do want to see new jobs, new houses. Other people want to see nothing touched. That, that's an underlying tension that's there. So you're always going to within the community body to have people who are disappointed. Having said that, when they unite together and are engaged, there's that, there, there's that tremendous benefit that they're actually taking the whole community forward with the project, which is a, which is a huge positive as well. So you, you can... You can envisage situations where it works very well and situations where it works very badly. And I do think that the closer you get to centres of population and desirable places to live, such as you've described, the greater that tension is going to be. If you're out in, in the West, you know, the, the Hebrides, generally speaking, the issues that are energising the, the, the community are, are really largely shared. There's not that much difference. They want more young folk there, they want more jobs there, they want more houses there. They, 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 there is a, there's a core vision that they can all subscribe to as the community, and they find it far easier to do that in that type of environment. But actually, but if you come to uh, a place where the amenities are very nice, and there's plenty of other jobs, and it's a beautiful place, and people want to live there for lots of different reasons, well, they will have lots of different visions as to what that future should be for that community. And what you can say is this, <laughs> because and I know this from experience, is that uh, you know, when a community, you know, if you have a community divided and they're fighting, it is, it's worse than, than, than a, a fight with a landowner. Because with a landowner, if he's a bad landowner, everyone hates him. So there's the bad guy. Uh, yeah, exactly. They unite around the fact that if it wasn't for this terrible landowner, we would all be whatever it is. But when you have a committee, a community body that has two different visions and you've split it down the middle, the fighting that happens in that environment is, is, of, a, is of a magnitude far beyond what happens in the landowner. And, you know, if you were to go a few years back, yes, you, had, or you did have bad landowners, but everyone, that, that was part of what you chatted about on a Friday and Saturday night, you know, there was a bad landowner who wasn't doing this. And there weren't all bad landowners, but in a community situation, if, if you have a division, it's very difficult. And, and the one last thing I would just add is that I think that Dave Stewart had a very interesting <coughs> point about the question of taxation. He had a very interesting point there. Uh, in our work, we've often had to look at boundary disputes, uh, and there's a very interesting source of material for determining boundaries, which arose from a census of the whole of the land in the UK between 1905 and 1915. It was carried out by the Inland Revenue. And there's a series of maps which you can effectively get, to, which we've had to look at generally with historic cross boundary disputes, which we do quite a number of. Um, look to the, that, that source. Now, the point is that that Inland Revenue exercise was done in order to value all the land in the UK, uh, 1905 to 1915. And the reason it was done was to value the land so that a property tax could be introduced. And it valued the property, it even valued land with crops on it, and see what the value of the crop was, valued the school, valued the buyer, everything. It's amazing in its detail. It was an incredible exercise that was done. And the purpose was to determine the economic benefit of that asset with a view to taxing it. And that taxation regime, as I understand it, was going to operate regardless <coughs> of whether any income was made from it or not. So... And I, I think that that type of tax introduces, you may agree with it, you may disagree with it, but introduces a mechanism which in a sense kind of sidesteps the question of ownership and says, is the asset being used? <coughs> so to take Elaine's point about, you know, or, or I think about land banking, planning consents, that's a big issue. Lots of people sitting on planning consents because the value goes up. Now, if those planning consents were taxed, you were taxed for not using the land then people would build the houses, or they wouldn't go and get the planning consent. You wouldn't sit on it anyway. And I think with regard to underutilised assets, there is a concept there that I think we're missing. If you tax the potential value of the asset, you encourage someone to either get rid of it and give it to someone else who can build on it or use it, or to do it themselves. Thanks, Andrew. I want to come to Murdo in a minute. And then, and then. <coughs> I oh, was just a quick question. So, if that map was designed for the purposes of taxing the land, why did it never happen? Well, I think what happened is the First World War came along. Okay. Uh, it was between 1905 to 1915, but it's a fascinating study. 
you may be able to say for the <coughs> public register, the Highland Council are the register of is it derelict land or unused land? Um, vacancy and derelict. Yeah. yeah. And is that re is that registered public? Uh, I don't know. It's, it's a, you make a, a return to the government, social government. True. So there are records available. Oh, there would be a record, yeah. Okay. Martin, sorry, you wanted to come in a while ago. Thank you. Yeah, just a slightly different question, because listening to the to the practitioner's talk, that would be very useful. Um, so much of this debate around land reform, we talk about public engagement and public consultation. I'd be interested to get your perspectives on the extent to which you think the public are in fact, the public and policymakers are properly informed, uh, properly engaged in this debate. So when we're asking the public their views, you know, do you think the public really understand issues around the rural economy? From, from the point of view of practitioners, what's your perception? <laughs> Probably not, not fully, no. Um, I think there's a great gulf between what people know about land and its use and everything is. I think it's... I think that, that, that chasm has widened as years go on. I think perhaps years ago, people knew much more about what was happening in their land and what was going to be done. But I think that's, that's, that's I don't think they do. I don't think, I think it's a, I don't think they do. Andrew, do you think policymakers are well enough informed? Well, I think if you look at the specific context of the agricultural holdings review legislation, the, 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 the relevant opposing parties, if you could describe it that way, are, are pretty well engaged as to as to what they want to see happen. You know, they, they've got their organisations, whether it's the SDFA or Scottish Landowners Federation, you know, or they're now a uh, kind of body. These different bodies, they, they've all got the people in play and they can bring out their examples as well of the things that have gone wrong. The only thing I would say about this is that Regardless of what system you get, there will always be things that go wrong. People litigate for a variety of reasons. Now, this kind of suggestion that it's actually a, it, it's, how can you put it, that it's, it's a, it's the fault of this, the system that these problems arise. It's not often the fault of the system. The system may not prevent it as well as it could, but the fundamental point is that people litigate for a variety of reasons. They litigate for a commercial reason. Sometimes they want to get a commercial benefit. Sometimes they litigate because they're right and they want to prove that the other person is wrong. And they're absolutely sure that they're right and the other person is definitely wrong. It's a I, I mean, I've had croft disputes, for example, where the person has come to me and said, and, and I've given advice about it, and say, well, you know, you're really going to struggle in this one. And the response has been, an emotive association with the land. I received this land from my father, and that's what he pointed out to me, and that's what I am I'm going to litigate about. I'm going to fight this right to the end. And that's not unusual, because land is, is there are strong uh, emotions associated with land, and so the disputes that arise arise for a variety of reasons. So the point is that in a consultation exercise, you're always going to come forward with examples of bad things that happen, things that have been litigated, and it's not it's not always to the system. But sometimes it's just to do with people. People litigate, people dispute, uh, and sometimes rich people take it. Well, quite often rich people take you know will dispute because they've got the money to dispute and they want to sort it out. And they, as far as they're concerned. That's just what, what they're going to do. So I'm not convinced that I'm not convinced that you'll be getting a full measure of what the true reality is of the of the of the of the, the relations between the, 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 the different bodies uh, by the view. I'm not convinced that uh, the consultation process is giving you a, a, a full flavour of it. But I think the best that you can do is to look at the worst excesses and try to. Try to deal with them. That's what I would say. Jamie, are uh, policymakers listening? And if, if you think they're not, is there a better system? Uh, are they listening and do they understand the issues? Uh, one of the difficulties we've got, I think, is now with the professional politicians. It used to be that politicians how were farmers or foresters or accountants or what have you and then went into politics. Now we're getting what I call a professional politician who goes from school to university to study politics who goes into politics 
it's what I call, the, I, my bet noir was the, me doing forestry, was the uh, lecturer in the applied subject who never actually practiced what he preached and therefore was completely academic and totally away with the fairies most of the time. My concern is this is one of the problems with the politicians. The other difficulty we've got is lobbyists. Uh, yes, we've got a Scottish land in the States who lobby. We've got people like the John Muir Trust who lobby. And unfortunately, some of our politicians are very vulnerable to it. I mean, <laughs> we're learning, marketing has now become the thing. you know. And very often these politicians, if the lobbyist with the shortest skirt gets the most... Uh, you know, gets the biggest time with the politician, this is what turns it on. Um, we see right back to Christine Keeler and this sort of thing. And unfortunately, I mean, I know that I can speak as long as I like to uh, Rob Gibson, who's chairman of the Rural Affairs Committee. And however much I say, I suspect only 10% will get through. On the other hand, I can speak to Alex Ferguson and he'll agree to the point where I feel he's been condescending, who's the Conservative on the Rural Affairs Committee. So, we've got a balance. I think the answer is we've got a mixture. Uh, I think we have to be able to speak clearer to our politicians. Uh, we have to take them out on the ground. Uh, we need to kidnap them and drag them up and make them do a bit of farming for a few weeks or months. Uh, cutting down some trees in order that they really understand what the issues are. Um, I think it was Castro who said, insisted that everyone in the government work for two or three weeks on the ground, you know, on the land. And I think this would actually probably be the best way in order for the politicians to fully understand and then we could say, yes, they understand the issues. Yeah. So you disappoint me in, in, in a sense to me because I thought you were going to say because MSPs are all about making law you couldn't be an MSP unless you'd first been a solicitor. <laughs> yeah. But there we are. Murdy, you asked the question. What's your view? Well, can I just say, Jimmy, I'm, I'm not a professional politician. I had, I had 15 years in legal practice before I became a, became a, became a politician. Which probably is, is, makes it even worse. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. So I think, I mean, I do, I do think there is an issue, not maybe the point of view of policymakers, but I think the point of view of the public. I think the issue about how much public ignorance there is around mm -hmm. some of the land issues we've been talking about today, about um, the economics of running a rural business, about um, uh, you know, the, 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 the pressures, um, the ability of doing business in a rural area where there aren't local services, where there's no police officer to call on, and there's no rural crime. You know, there's a whole range of things. I think the public sometimes have a very starry eyed view of the rural economy and don't really see how tough it is. Okay. Can I just say I would pay money to watch a bunch of MSPs working in your fields? <laughs> <laughs> well, I did when they were, you know, deciding that we should reduce all our deer. I said maybe we should change our prey species from deer to politician. But unfortunately, they weren't a lean meat. But I did find there was an awful lot of people who uh, were willing to to join in. I, I suspect if we were having this conversation in urban Glasgow. Or urban Edinburgh, it would be from a very different perspective. I, I'm very aware as I sit here and look out, and I know who I know in the audience, that we, we are a very representative group of people from this community. It would be very different I'm sure if we were uh, in Glasgow. Get them back. Yes, I'm Alan Lawyer, a retired policeman. It's a question really for Jamie I'm going to ask, and it's about an example of an estate near him. You'll know the estate, which is the main estate. Uh, my brother-in-law tenanted the farm for many years, his, nephew, his son, my nephew, was now tenanting it. Prior to that there was a Dutch owner and then an American owner, and it's always, the whole estate has always been tenanted. Now the present Kawiki owner, I think, he was bought for him by his father, a young lad, he now wants him to retreat from the hill ground and just have the arable and grazing ground, and he wants to keep the hill for himself after all these years of the whole farm being tenanted. I just want to get Jamie's opinion on that estate. I'm sure he knows it very well. I know the estate, yes. Uh, Donny Munro, I think, is the That's right, yes. uh, tenant. And Majid Jafar, um, whose English is better than mine, but uh, comes from Dubai, uh, is the owner. He's bought it 
for his hunting, shooting, fishing. Um, he has objected to all my mad schemes like wind farms and hydro schemes and stuff. Um, and yes, I think uh, I hadn't appreciated that he was wanting to move the tenant to just the low ground, but obviously because his interest is in uh, the high ground, uh, he'll almost certainly be wanting to put sheep on as tick mops. Um, this is where, uh, the t when I say the tenancy breaks down, where the, both the far the owner and the tenants are all trying to work to try and improve the economy, um, there's usually an easier point where you can actually work together because you're all for the same aim. Where the land becomes very marginal and ends up being bought by someone who could be like John Muir Trust who wants to create a wilderness or in this case Majid Jafar who wants it primarily for his hunting, shooting, fishing and is not interested in um, developing the rural economy uh, in the same way, this has a potential for conflict. Uh, and this is probably the tragedy of uh, the highlands where so much of our land is so marginal, it's ended up being purchased by people who want it for seclusion and exclusivity or for <coughs> conservation or for something which doesn't necessarily marry in with trying to improve the economy. Uh, and I think this is one of the problems that we've got. I hadn't appreciated the you users. Said something? Tick? Tick, yes. Sheep, tick yes, what they do is you, you take your, your sheep and you put them on the hill in April. I mean, we used to, uh, in the days when men ruled, you took the women and children and they went out with your livestock, your cattle and sheep, out to the sheilings. You left them all there all summer, whilst the men stayed behind and sold the wild oats and made hay. Uh, and then you brought them back down in the winter uh, before the days of decent fencing. Nowadays, what has happened is the development of grouse, you've got this tick, uh, blood-sucking insect, which is, uh, bites into the grouse and tends to kill them. And it's also carried by deer. One of the best, it also eats ticks, uh, hill walkers as well, but they only get Lyme's disease. Uh, it doesn't kill them. Um, but what you do is you take your sheep, you dip them or you put Crovec or Dysec on their backs, which goes into their bloodstream. And when the ticks bite into the sheep, it kills the tick. So the best way of getting tick off your hill and reducing the tick, which also helps both for the sheep and for the hill walkers, and, but mainly for the grouse and the deer, uh, is to put sheep on the hill, treat them every six weeks, um, and I can see that, but my nephew already has sheep on the Right, and obviously he couldn't come to an agreement. Oh, I, I, don't, I'm not, I don't know the really, the, but that's, that's what the landowner has decided, that he, the tenant wants to retreat from the hill back to the wood ground. Right. After he's all my life, <laughs> and I'm not just... Uh, he's not doing himself any favours when I don't do Well, well having sheep on the hill is helping him. It's the density. Oh, it's, it's probably the density. When you're running a tick mop, you're running at a very high density because ah. you actually want to get quite a big investment in, 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 in pesticide, in insecticide, so you want to get a return on that investment. So actually, you put on more sheep to ensure that it actually works better. So you're actually lifting much more of the tick And what is that extra sheep on the hill doing to the, 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 to, to the state of the land and the state of the vegetation? Uh, well, I think you've got to go back two, three hundred years where we, before we had far more sheep cattle, uh, feral horses, goats, etc. on the hill. If you go back into Pitt Main's time, that was Clooney McPherson, and he had something like 3,000 uh, head of cattle on the hill. He had sheep on the hill. His tenants had sheep and goats. He then brought in gull cattle. That was a foreign cattle from Murrayshire coast up to graze. They then had the drove roads going through there, and they had the drover's cattle. So huge amount of far more herbivores on Pit Main in the 17, early 1800s than there was now. They then changed to sheep with sheep farming. They moved the people off Pit Main to Kinusi and Newton Moor. Uh, and then now the sheep have been coming off the hill. And this is one of the difficulties we've hit ourselves, is that the sheep on the hill aren't really cost effective anymore unless you're using for tick mops. But 
Whereas I would have said, work with the tenant to try to put them on the hill. I can see the thing that the tenant farmer makes his money for what I call the mules, the Beltex, the, uh, the sheep where he'll get twins and he won't put them on the hill so much. Uh, and what he puts on the hill, he'll only put them for a very short period of time because all he's wanting to do is extra grazing. Uh, it's not helping him to have them all on the, the hill for a long time and end up with a lot of them dying, etc. Mm -hmm. So it's getting very technical. <laughs> it, is, it is very technical, but uh, interesting nonetheless. Um, we are, I'm afraid, out of time in relation to this session. Uh, I'm going to hand back. Is it Jamie that's coming next, or is it Hector? Yeah. 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 But before we do that, will you join me in thanking our panel, Jamie and <laughs>